my talk today will be about relearning creativity. And as you've seen from the other talks, of course, I can't teach you anything in 20 minutes. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to give you three very concrete tools that you can go home and use to try to become a bit more creative person. The first thing I need to know from the audience is, of course, do you find yourself creative? So I want you all to close your eyes and keep your uh, eyes closed. If you feel like a creative person, raise your hand so I can see. OK. And then keep your hand up. A lot of people try to take it down and open your eyes again. Wow, this is a real great audience. OK, so that uh, will amplify one of my points. One of the things I normally see in audiences when I do this is people tend to take their hand down when I ask them to open their eyes. And that brings me to my first question of this talk, and that is, please, yeah. Why creativity? Why should any adult person want to be creative? Of course, creativity has kind of a bad reputation. And when I say I'm a uh, creativity expert, creativity researcher, people tend to say, oh, so you work with dance and music. And this to me is sort of a myth about creativity. And one of the reasons why I see people don't dare to claim themselves as creatives. And there are a lot of ways of understanding creativity. Normally you talk about the, either the creative person, the creative press, so the situation you're in, the creative process, or the creative product. So there are a lot of different ways of understanding creativity. Today I'll talk about the creative person, meaning your creative abilities. And when I talk about the creative person, then this is what normally people see on their eyelids. It's uh, Pablo Picasso. But I have a very different take on creativity, a very different type of creativity that I find as important and as interesting, and that is the Vladimir Putin creativity. Because Putin is, to me, a brilliant example of a world leader who is extremely good at using different ways of thinking to achieve his goals. I won't get political here, so I'll leave it there. But Luckily, I'm not the only one seeing these type of creative skills as seemingly importantly as the more creative, uh, cl in the classical sense, the more artistic domains. And one of my favorite studies was back in 2010. IBM did a big study where they asked 100, uh, 1,600 CEOs in more than 60 countries around the world whether these CEOs were prepared for the future. And actually, less than half of the CEOs they asked felt that they themselves and their companies were actually ready for the future. And then when asked what they could do better in their company to actually prepare for the future, creativity came out on top. So in more than 60 countries, these 1,600 CEOs agreed that creativity was actually what they needed to make their company resilient for the future. In another study that I really like, LinkedIn, they have this thing every year, they publish a list of the most common words people use to describe themselves. And in 2012, creative was the most commonly used word on LinkedIn when people describe themselves in their profiles. In 2013, it dropped to, I think, third, but responsible being on one, but it's still up there. So people still want to perceive themselves as creative. And this view on creativity, to me, changes the whole discourse about how we can actually train creativity. Because to me, we have to start seeing creativity as a fundamental human skill. It's something that we were born with, that we all need, and that is actually the key to success in any domain, any way of life, any way of living. And I think normally I would say that creativity is as important as an engineer for as an artist. And I love this because I see a lot of nodding here, so people seem to agree, you get the point, creativity is important. And after one of these talks I gave, um, this old engineer came up to me and he said, well, I really like your talk, very interesting, especially the point about like everyone should be creative. I think that's such a, a brilliant point. But you, know, you should also remember to mention that some of us still have to do the serious stuff, so the rest of you can be creatives. And, and that was after listening to me for 45 minutes, only talking about why creativity is important to teach in engineering schools. So, to make my point as clear as possible, in my point of view, when I talk about training creativity, it's not about art, it's about success in any aspect of life, that being work, private life, sex, cooking, wherever.
being a scientist, I always have this need to define exactly what I'm talking about. So I'll give you one of the many, many definitions of creativity with a very cliche example. So when I grew up, this was a cell phone. And this was a computer. And young me, these two things were radically separate. They were both technology. They both ran on batteries. The batteries could last for weeks and weeks, uh, despite the normal phones today. And it, when, when Apple introduced the iPhone, I was conceptually shocked because the two things, cell phone and computer, had so little in common that the, seeing the two things put together as one thing was, to me, really new. And it was really useful. I loved having this new thing. I just never thought about it because it was two separate things. And what I want you to pay attention to here is actually the conceptual difference between the original components. Because in my line of research, we see creativity as being the ability to take two or more concepts, concepts or conceptual understandings and put them together in something new that fulfills being novel, as in new, and also being useful for some kind of context. But why is this something we have to relearn? Why don't I talk about learning creativity? And I'll give you a very, very simple example. It's, it might be a bit caricated, but some of you, or most of you, have probably seen this before. It's called the nine-dot puzzle. The challenge is link all the nine dots using four straight lines or fewer without lifting the pen and without tracing the same line more than once. So I'll give you 15 seconds, normally it's 10 minutes. The embarrassing thing is kids have no problem with this. Kids do this right away. And I'll start by showing you why it's so hard for adults to solve this. So if you look at the person trying to solve this on, uh, on paper, this will be the solving strategy. Or will it? Let's see. Oh, yeah. So you start in one corner, you go to another corner, and you'll continue doing that until you realize I'm almost out of lines, and then you'll cross 45 uh, degrees, and realizing you're all out, and you still hasn't gone through all the nine dots. And the creative solution to this, the adult solution, is that you have to realize that you don't have to stop in a dot. And by realizing this, you can actually solve it. So the reason why this is a puzzle is because we put rules into it that are not there. The only person who told you that the line should connect two dots and stop there is some teacher in, math, uh, in a math class back in the days. But this still sticks. So the adult solution, the adult creative solution is like this. And I normally use this to warm up when I work with kids. And I remember the first time I did it, one of the pupils in the class, about six-year-old, when seeing this, he said, well, I can solve it with three straight lines. And you know, adult arrogant me would be like, oh, you're so cute. <laughs> yeah, come on and show me. And he did this. <laughs> and it's a completely fine solution. I've also seen kids folding the paper around, so you can sort of do it with one straight line just going around the paper in circles, which is also still fine. But in this sa same class, another pupil said, well, I can actually solve it with one straight line. And I had already been shocked once, so I was OK, maybe you can. He walked onto the <laughs> and he did this. And it's still a completely fine solution. It's just embarrassing that we didn't think about it, because we have this idea of there being a relationship between the thickness of a line and the size of a point. Right? Making this a really challenging task for adults, very simple task for kids. So something happened along the way. And it's consensus, uh, consensus more or less, in um, a lot of different creativity research trends that people get less creative when they grow up. So basically, it looks something like this. And you probably some of you have seen the famous Ken Robinson talk. If you haven't, you should. This is a TED talk. He talks about this for uh, 40 minutes. And it's more or less very well accepted. Another thing that is, to me, as, a, uh, as an expert, even more scary is they're, they're also done a lot of studies on the relationship between expertise and creativity within that same domain. So extremely simplified, you have some kind of learning curve within the domain. The dotted line here represents the 10,000 hour line, which is, of course, the expertise line. And what these studies show is something like this. 
So you can be very creative when you enter a new domain because you don't have all the rules of the domain. Then your creativity in the domain more or less progresses alongside your expertise. But right before you have your 10,000 hours, then your creativity within the same domain starts going down. So it's something about not knowing too much within your own expertise if you want to be able to perform creatively. This is quite challenging. So there are a lot of explanations for exactly what happens as we grow up and various explanations for why we lose our creativity. I'll mainly focus on one which I think is the one that is easiest to train and that we are working with training with students, and that's our associative limitations. Bringing you back to the example about the iPhone, when I talk about the conceptual distance, is in our associ associations, back in the days, a cell phone computer were very far associations. Nowadays, they're considered more or less the same thing. But as we grow up, we get more and more boxes, more and more frames, making it really hard for us to connect things that aren't put in the same box by someone else. So what a lot of creativity training is about is actually improving the brain's ability to find different pieces of information that seem to be irrelevant at the time. It's that simple. So I'll give you three very quick um, tools for how you can train your associ um, associ associative network. The first one is continuous practice. This is something you can do every day. The second one is a way to use your sleep as a creative technique. And the third one is a right now solution. If you're stuck with a creative problem, what can you do to get to the next step? So let's start with the continuous practice thing. I'll do this when I brush my teeth every night. And I want to give an example of this. I want you all to look at the toothbrush and think of three random words quickly. Three random words. And then try to analyze how random were those words really. Maybe it was like dog, bicycle, shirt, uh, water, traveling, something you've seen within the last couple of hours, at least, or maybe just related to what you're looking at right now. So what I do when I brush my teeth is I challenge myself to think of random words that are actually random. So if the, the starting word would be toothbrush, what would be a random word? Someone? What? Camel. Yeah, that's, that's great. OK, I, yeah, I would think about the brush. And the, yeah, but still, it's pretty far. Car tire could be another one. But what I do is basically I try to come up with a new, completely random word as quick as possible, a word that has nothing to do with the previous word I was thinking about. And then I keep doing that. And I can feel like almost every week I get better at it. So this ability to, for randomness, there was recently done a really cool um, neuros, uh, imaging study of hip hop artists who are good with improvising words. And those guys blew any creativity test away. Because their ability to randomly pick some words and then connect them to something else and then come up with something that no one else thought of is actually a very important part of being creative. So very simply, as often as you can, try to challenge yourself coming up with random words. It's an important part of creativity training. The second tool is a bit more technical to explain, but it's very simple to do. So what you see up here is a very simplified version of how we sleep. And what it's trying to say is, from we fall asleep, we go into deep sleep, and then about every 90 minutes, we are in, in what is called rapid eye movement sleep or just dream sleep. So above the red line here, that's where you have your dreams. As you probably all uh, remember, in your dreams, you don't apply too many rules, right? So you can be in Italy over here, and then walk into Spain, and sort of no one else would notice that I'm still in the same room. So you don't apply the same rules, which are the rules that destroy our creativity. So if we can manage to use our dream sleep to be creative, it's actually a way to work around all these rules we use when we're awake. So how do you prime your sleep? How do you prime what you dream about? In one of my favorite studies, they did it with Tetris. So they had people playing Tetris right before they fell asleep, and then they woke them up in dream sleep, and I asked them what they've dreamt about. And almost every participant had some element of Tetris in their sleep, so family members falling into place or something that resembled Tetris. And the way you can use this to try to be more creative is very simple. Right before you fall asleep, try to think about the problem 
you want to solve. Try to think about all the information you would need to solve it. But of course, you should not try to solve it because then you will not fall to sleep. We all know that feeling. And then the chance of you actually dreaming about this without all the normal constraints improves. And then try to make sure that you wake up after some kind of 90 minute cycle. So it could be six hours, seven and a half hours, nine hours of sleep. So the chance of waking up in a dream sleep is bigger. And then in the morning, take notes. Did I dream about anything related to my problem? And no matter how far-fetched it seems when you wake up, try to note it down because it will give you some new thoughts about whatever problem you're working on. We can't always go to sleep when we want to solve a problem. So the last technique of today is randomness. As I said, we are terrible at randomness. If I ask for a random bird, it will, has a re uh, it will be related to something. So what this technique is about is if you're stuck with a problem, you can't find a way to solve it, introduce some randomness. I use uh, Wikipedia. They have a random article button. And then what you get is a completely unexpected piece of information. And then what you do is you challenge yourself. I have a problem. I have this random piece of information. Probably never heard about it before. Can I in some way force that information into my problem? One very concrete example is this. Uh, we were working on uh, a project with, uh, where we struggled with the production technology. And then I did this, and up came a list of Russian boxers in the 105 kilogram uh, category. And one of their names reminded me of an old teacher who told me about this very specific old production method that I hadn't thought about in a long time that we could actually use to solve our problem. So this sort of extremely weird link I would never have thought of if I hadn't looked at random Wikipedia. As I said, I can't promise you guys to be more creative right now than you were 20 minutes ago. What I want you to promise me is that every single person in here will try one of the three following things. This is not hard. This is the 70%. Go home and try one of these for yourself. Either practice while you brush your teeth tonight, random words, or before you go to bed tonight, think about some kind of creative challenge and try to wake up after six, seven and a half or nine hours. Or next time you're stuck with a creative problem, press the random button on Wikipedia and you will get some new inspiration. Thank you so much for listening. It was a joy. Thanks. Thank